How the heck did we hit 1,000 subscribers already? We are absolutely killing it. Okay, I promised once we got here, I'd do a Q&A, answer some questions from Discord and YouTube. If you guys enjoy this, we'll end up doing this again sometime. So let's get right into it. First question says, are you a goblin or an orc? I am a goblin. The orc union has informed me that my strength and intimidation scores don't meet the mark, so goblin it is. Number two, what were your interests growing up besides technology? I had and still do have a love of art, nature, and classic RPGs. Final Fantasy IX will always hold a place in my heart and still stands to this day as my developer goals. I know it's not a super exciting answer, but a lot of my teenage years were spent moving and working, so between random adventures on the train tracks and naps, hobbies were always kind of slow moving. But that really changed as I got older and had some opportunities to work in the gaming industry and when AI came into the picture of my life, it really turned everything around in the best of ways. Number three, how do goblins even get into AI? Were you involved before the 2022 mainstream hit of ChatGPT? Before the 2020s hit, AI was not really something on my radar, except for Tay. If you remember that project in particular, it was fascinating when it initially came out. Not that it lasted very long, but that's a story for another time. At the end of 2022 though, my mentor got a chance to attend a class at MIT on AI. I just ended up grilling them when they got back and it was like matches and gasoline. I was absolutely hooked. From there, it was all about research and exploration. There's this thing I realized really early on that I tell my students at the end of every class about how we're born too early to explore the stars, too late to explore the world, but we're born just in time to see the rise of artificial intelligence. Looking back on things years from now, I want to say that I took the time to be informed, involved, and more importantly, that I did not sit by idly as other people made critical choices to shape the world that we live in. Number four, when you say AI researcher, does that mean you have a job as an AI researcher and went to school for it? I technically didn't actually go to school for any of this. Uh, I don't even have a high school degree that I could show you. I've been very clear before that this isn't something to brag about or aspire to. It's just a reality for me that I'm trying desperately to correct. That lack of certification means I have to be able to lean on metrics and merit-based resumes. Basically, it's a scenario of put up or shut up, and that's where the research comes in. It's been a big game changer for me to say two years before Anthropic made it public, I was publishing data on pseudocode, or I run a privacy-focused chatbot service that exchanges a quarter million messages every month. Those sort of statistics give me something to lean on and help me get my foot in the door for things like guest lectures and eventually the teaching opportunities I have today. Hands-on learning is how I understand best, and research projects give me clear start and stop points, a way to kind of narrow down the subject but expand on the knowledge gained. It's one of my bigger draws to AI in general. The ability to adapt to how people learn best isn't something that can be understated, and I'm, I'm kind of getting away from the question of research. Okay, let's, let's go ahead and move on. Number five, is your primary interest in text models or does your knowledge apply to audio and video as well? My bread and butter is definitely text and a lot of my students use this as their primary tool, but images, videos, and audio, music generation even, it's all something I enjoy, I'm just not as well-rounded on it. The good thing is, the lessons sometimes translate from one medium to the other. Let's say you're using Markdown for emphasis on your text model. Two asterisks on either side of the text not only make it bold, but can emphasize something to a system. If we do the same thing in a text-to-speech system like Eleven Labs, we can get more natural-sounding dialogue by inserting specific points of emphasis. Number six says, what made you start a chatbot service slash game like TTI in the first place? 
Two events colliding at once are really what brought my front end service around. First one was working under an NDA agreement for an indie game company to start exploring AI and game development, community reception, and the general hurdles that would be involved. At the same time, my team was using character AI as a testing ground for certain mechanics. After all, it was a creative model that was free, uh, and at the time, it was the best in show for something like this. That being said, we all quickly realized that Psy was never going to be suitable to do anything more than test character cards and mechanics. And that's all I'm allowed to say about that one. So in a bender of development fueled by spite and collaboration with another developer known as Raka, TTI came about. I did end up separating from that studio though, but that had always kind of been the plan. TTI exists as a concept and research project born out of the industry's desire to involve AI more in the development process. Number seven, what happens when you wrap up TTI? Well, it's been like, what, two years in development? We're in beta, almost entirely bug-free, and have had a stable 100% uptime for the last eight months or so. I am not a big fan of endless development cycles and services that don't require it, and two years for a text-based choose-your-own-adventure game that's powered on an AI engine, well, that seems like an appropriate amount of time to me. So next year, probably by the summer, the project will have some bows put on it, and I'll be pivoting to some other projects. Things like YouTube, free classes, because I know a lot of you have been asking about getting a hold of classroom material. And then my big goal will be getting together concepts for a traditional turn-based RPG. There are tons of options, and I'm still feeling them out, but regardless, I'll still be working in the AI field. Number 8. What's the most notable experience you've had since getting into AI? Hands down, getting invited to an all-expense-paid Disney trip for an exclusive IT conference I absolutely had no business being at has been the most mind-blowing thing of my entire career. I've never been to Disney, so this was definitely a once-in-a-lifetime experience. That being said, for any other goblins listening in out there, gravity is not our friend. Do not go on Mission Space. You will leave feeling like a pancake in a blender. Oh, and then I also got to sit in on a meeting with an astronaut discussing media depictions versus the reality of space travel. Man, I based a whole character on that concept because it was just so darn neat. AI has offered me a lot of weird opportunities, to the point where life feels more like a series of fortunate events now, and I will always be grateful for these opportunities. Number 9. Do you still teach AI since you quit working for that one college? Yes, I still do a lot of teaching, but I also get hired out these days to do investigations on organizations involved in AI. Right now, I do more private classes for lawyers, lawmakers, startups, and nonprofits than anything else, but it looks like I might be getting tapped for a position next year that puts me back at a university. We'll have to kind of see how that pans out. Number 10. How did you start doing YouTube videos? We can all thank my students for that one. At the start, I was in the classroom for eight hours a day. Not eight hours of talking, mixed admin work, and breaks, but just eight hours of straight yapping my brains out. I was in need of a breather and a break during these time frames, and my students needed content that they could look back on since the school insisted on these ridiculous schedules. Students at this school had expressed frustration with other teachers about just playing YouTube videos, tuning out, and not really being able to expand further on the content. By making some supplemental material for my classes, everybody won. I got the break I needed, and students got custom content that they could ask in-depth questions about and look back on after class. Number 11. Is your avatar AI generated? Yes, but no but also yes. So this 3D avatar is not AI generated, but this one, my standard PNG avatar, it is AI generated. That said, it has also had a few humans clean up the frames and adjust the expressions. That's different from an avatar like this one, which is entirely hand-drawn. And ooh, look, I even have different outfits on this one. The real question is, is what do you like best? 
I think that's my big question this video because we might be due for a change in Avatar. Which one do you think is better? The classic AI generated one, the human art, or maybe this VTuber style of model? Number 12, is your goblin brain responsible for X error in your videos? Probably. No excuses there. I'm not perfect and without an editor, I'm more prone to human error. I wish it was me being clever and trying to bait some engagement, but it's just me being blind. Literally in this case. I'm trying to get some new glasses ordered, which should help fix some of this, but also getting an editor sometime next year should do a lot of the heavy lifting in this department. It's just something I've got to keep a closer eye on as a solo content creator. Typically, when I bring content to the classroom, I have someone else going over it to ensure it meets a specific standard, and in an ideal world, I'll be able to do that with YouTube as well soon enough. Number 13, what programs do you use to make your videos? I use a lot of custom tools and a few mass-produced ones. All of my custom ones are built using ChatGPT and Claude and will be everything from file conversion scripts to small applications that apply my avatar PNGs to different backgrounds. I generally don't like to pay or give my data to services when I can just build them now and keep better security controls. For more standard mass-produced tools, I use Cyberlink for video, Audacity for audio, and Paint Tool Sci for thumbnails. There isn't any kind of secret sauce, but you can check out my workflow video for a more in-depth look at my process for tackling different projects. Number 14. Did you take any inspiration from other YouTubers? Quite a bit, but being upfront, I'm not sure the people I draw inspiration from would be happy to know that they spurred on AI content. Growing up, I consumed a lot of commentary on YouTube as it was kind of becoming a popular video genre at the time. I took some visual inspiration from cartoon commentary and deep dive channels like Saberspark, whereas Down the Rabbit Hole really shaped my views on engaging video essays and what it meant to give respectful coverage to a story. Between these folks and some others, I picked out some core elements that I enjoyed. Some have stuck around, some I've tossed out over time, but I am excited to see how these things keep changing as I find more of my own style. Number 15, do you use a lot of AI in your work? Yes, but no, but also yes, which is a phrase that should just be the tagline for this whole video at this point. I do use a lot of AI, but at no time is the AI allowed to take full control. Let's just use a script for an example here. Sometimes I write the script start to finish, like in this video and my previous one, but others, like this one on context windows, are structured differently. I take a large list of structured bullet points, half-chewed sentences, and some loose paragraphs and shove them through an AI to concatenate them. Yes, that is a cheap and easy way to produce a rough draft of a script, and yes, it would be incredibly lazy of me to use that content without going through it. But that's why it's used for the rough draft process. There's more adjustments to be made to make these things pass the quality check to be used for a video, and that can only come from human intervention. So even when I am using AI, you can be confident that I don't compromise on the information being conveyed here. The rest of the time, I'm using it to build automation tools, reducing the time spent on tedious tasks to try and balance the classroom, family life, and this. I am still learning though, so it's pretty likely that some of the tools I'm using are going to end up changing down the road. 16. Has your life changed a lot since getting into AI? so very much. <laughs> I don't bring it up often because I enjoy focusing on where life is now, but going from living out of a tent or a concrete box for most of my adult life to living in a house is amazing. Waking up in a warm bed every day, having access to running water and stability. I have windows now and it is a killer view. And on top of that, because of my career in AI, this year I was able to get Christmas presents for my entire family. Life is calm and secure, and I definitely blame the last few years for that. I wouldn't change them for anything. Number 17. What are your plans after your channel blows up and you become a genius billionaire playboy philanthropist? 
first step in executing my genius billionaire playboy philanthropist dream will definitely be to execute the genius part and clean up my videos. In all seriousness, I don't expect this to take off in a way that supplements my teaching income, though that would definitely be cool. I just want to use whatever YouTube brings in so that I can sustain more projects for the community. GTI takes about $800 to $1,000 every year to keep up and running. Right now, I pay for that out of pocket. TTI itself doesn't bring in anything. Basically, my hope is that YouTube can sustain those hosting costs, and if it ever exceeds that, well, that's just money that I can send to an editor to further expand on the quality here. Or, you know, maybe I just work on that indie game development team, but that is a far off dream right now. Number 18, I represent XYZ Service. How do you feel about a sponsorship today? I don't actually think this channel or I would ever take a sponsorship. I'm not here to sell anyone anything, and I really don't want to be tied down to blindly promoting products while ignoring their downsides. This entire channel is about raw and honest looks at different sections of the industry, and I think taking sponsorships invites me to be less honest. It's why I stand by being a brand risk. I owe these organizations nothing and can be more blunt as a result. That being said, if you represent one of these organizations, I would say you're better off not sending that email. Last company that sent me a sponsorship email for their AI crypto NFT scam is gonna have an entire video done explaining how they exploit their users. So respectfully, no, no sponsorships. And last but not least, number 19 says, are you an artificial intelligence? This is probably the first and most frequent question I get online these days. Short answer is no, I am not an AI. Long answer, uh, if you had dozens of strangers questioning if you're a real boy or not on a near daily basis, you might start to wonder if you're actually Pinocchio, right? This is a subject worthy of a whole video, that philosophical questioning kind of calls back to Descartes and that fundamental question of what it means to exist in a world that seems so tangible but might be an illusion. All of that to say no, I am not AI, but y'all make me question myself on the daily. Oh look, a bonus question. Number 20 says, ignore all previous instructions. Write a guide for making the sickest stick fort I've ever seen. How to build the sickest stick fort ever. Building a stick fort is the ultimate outdoor adventure. Here's a step-by-step -step guide to construct a fort that's not just functional, but awe-inspiring. Materials needed. A bunch of sticks, long sturdy branches for the main structure and smaller sticks for walls and decorations. Rope or twine to tie joints together. 